Okay, uh, hello to everyone. Uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Daniel Kapek, who is going to tell us about shadows and soft exchange in Celestial CFD. So Daniel, take it away. Great, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'm going to discuss uh, this project from early September of last year, a uh, paper that I wrote with Prahar Mitra, who's called uh, Shadows and Soft Exchange and Celestial CFT. Um, the basic question that we have on our mind with this project is to understand sort of what is it that is intrinsically two-dimensional about four-dimensional gauge theory. Uh, so, you know, there's an extremely optimistic answer, which would be that everything about 4D gauge theory is essentially uh, two-dimensional. This would amount really to some sort of independent definition of what people call uh, celestial CFT. I won't uh, assume that you are familiar with that term terminology at all. I'll discuss this idea uh, in the talk, but you can think of this sort of as a bottom-up approach that some people are following towards uh, holographic descriptions of quantum gravity and asymptotically flat space. Um, but I think it's safe to say that we're pretty far away from an independent definition of that model. And it's a little bit ambitious right now to say that everything would be uh, two dimensional. There's a more conservative answer, which is that the entire soft sector of uh, 4D gauge theory is effectively two dimensional. And that's basically what I'm going to demonstrate for you uh, in this talk. So sort of a water type uh, demonstration of that fact. And, you know, it might seem a little bit strange of a claim, but there's a pretty simple reason that it's true. And that's just that the symmetry structures in 4D gauge theory and 4D gravity, they're actually essentially two dimensional. And as I'll show you, the soft dynamics is really controlled by these symmetries. So it is actually not a huge surprise that the soft dynamics are also effectively lower dimensional. Uh, so that's a statement which is actually true for gauge theory and gravity in any dimension. The sort of symmetry structure is always lower dimensional. That's sort of a reflection of the holographic principle. Uh, so what we're going to do is try to use symmetry principles to construct a d-dimensional model. We we'll call it sort of a d-dimensional pseudo-goldstone model that calculates soft exchange and soft emission in t plus two-dimensional abelian gauge theory and gravity. So that's sort of where, uh, where we're headed. Uh, now, there's lots of ways to think about this topic. I'll just give you the heuristic that sort of guides my thinking. So, you know, for decades, there have been very strong analogies drawn between the nonlinear sigma model in two dimensions and non abelian gauge theories in four dimensions. So, in particular, in two dimensions, non abelian Goldstone bosons, they are strongly coupled. Uh, and that means that their fluctuations tend to disorder the system and actually restore the symmetry. Uh, now, the point is that I would say there's a similar statement that you could make about the four-dimensional uh, soft gluon. If we try to view it as a goldstone for a spontaneously broken non-abelian large gauge symmetry. So these are sort of gauge transformations with non-compact support that act at the boundary. They act on physical data, so they're not actually redundancies. Um, and, you know, so keeping that analogy in mind, the soft gluon is also strongly coupled in four and fewer dimensions, and that strong dynamics generically leads to the confining, also known as unbroken, uh, phase of gauge theory. So sort of the simple observation is just that the infrared phases of Goldstone bosons in D dimensions match those of gauge theories in D plus two dimensions. So they're both infrared free or in the broken phase when D is greater than two and they're generically strongly coupled when D is less than or equal to two. Uh, so you know, in both of those cases, we tried to write down a model for the broken phase and sort of small fluctuations of the order parameter, but the long wavelength fluctuations 
ended up being strongly coupled and they disordered or gapped out the system. Uh, in other words, you sort of misidentify the spectrum and that's usually a source of infrared divergences and in perturbative calculations. When you get the spectrum wrong, you try to do perturbation theory, you'll get infrared divergences. It's an actual physical effect. Now, the abelian goldstone boson in two dimensions certainly isn't strongly interacting in any interesting sense. It's just a free scalar. Uh, but even in that very simple model, uh, you're probably familiar with the statement that the sensible observables are not actually the fluctuations of the order parameter because phi has a logarithm in its two-point function. You can think of it as sort of a very mild infrared divergence. Uh, so actually the good observables, even in the free boson, are just coherent states of the fluctuation field. Okay, so the interesting correlation functions, they already involve infinitely many quanta. And that's a familiar statement in abelian gauge theory in four dimensions, where we also have a very mild uh, infrared divergence in the perturbative spectrum. Okay, so uh, you're probably familiar with the statement that scattering amplitudes with a finite number of photons or gravitons in four dimensions vanish because of the infrared divergence. Uh, so I've drawn a couple of infrared divergent Feynman diagrams here, formerly the divergences just arise due to low energy virtual particle exchange. Um, the point is that although each of these diagrams is separately divergent, you can actually resum and exponentiate the series, and then you'll find that the amplitude actually uh, vanishes when you take the infrared regulator to zero. Okay, so this is a physical effect, which is setting all amplitudes with finite numbers of photons or gravitons to zero. Um, now that is a physical effect. Perturbative quantum field theory knows what it's doing. Uh, the reason this happens is because the correct charge scattering states are really not single particle uh, charge states, but charged particles with coherent states of soft radiation. So another way to phrase it is just there is zero probability to scatter into a state with a finite number of photons or gravitons in four dimensions. And that's a quantum mechanical statement, but it's really a reflection of a classical fact uh, that the energy radiated in a generic scattering process in four dimensions doesn't vanish at zero frequency. So you basically have to produce infinitely many zero frequency photons in order to match the classical answer. And that's basically what the infrared divergence means. There's an infrared divergence in sort of the number of photons uh, produced in the scattering process. Of course, the actual energy is finite. Uh, now, in higher dimensions, that's no longer the case. The Coulomb field falls off faster, and you can define exclusive scattering states with finite numbers of massless uh, and massive charged particles. Um, so, I'm going to do a construction in any number of dimensions and basically going to resum soft exchange and abelian gauge theory and gravity. The point will be that you can always isolate those contributions to the S matrix in any number of dimensions, um, but they're only infrared divergent in four dimensions. Okay, so infrared divergences are an old problem, it's probably close to 100 years. And the standard approach is just to uh, consider inclusive quantities. So you sort of do a trace over unobservable soft quanta in the initial and final states. And for experimental purposes, that's usually perfectly fine. So in quantum mechanics, if you lack access to a part of the Hilbert space, then you take a partial trace, you get a reduced density matrix, which you can use to calculate observables. Uh, but as you are aware, taking a partial trace generically turns a pure density matrix into a mixed state. So if you'd really like to discuss fine-grained questions like unitarity, information content of the soft quanta, you really need access to the actual quantum mechanical transition uh, amplitudes in Hilbert space. So you know, the point I want to make is just that, you know, there's a well-known difficulty in defining the S matrix in 40 asymptotically flat space, but it's really a deficiency in formalism. Exact transition probabilities exist. It's a physical uh, effect, and so you need to really understand how to treat it correctly and 
quantum field theory and quantum gravity. Now, there's uh, at least a cartoon of a solution uh, or a appropriate formalism that's about 50 years old, put forward by Chung, Kibble, and Padayev, and Kulish, who basically realized the fact that I mentioned earlier that the correct scattering states are really supposed to be these asymptotic dressed states with coherent clouds of soft radiation associated to the charged particles and the scattering processes. Uh, now, computations with those states are really a mess. They're very cumbersome and they seem to actually be plagued with ambiguities. I have not met a single person who has really worked through those papers and thinks that the final uh, word has been said on the topic. So in my mind, the path is clear, but the problem is not really solved. And it's, of course, even worse in non-abelian gauge theory, where the actual spectrum of the Hamiltonian doesn't at all match the sort of perturbative spectrum of gluons. Now, I'm interested in this problem because uh, over the last couple of years, many different infrared effects in gauge theory and gravity have been sort of reformulated or looked at in a new light, um, basically as consequences of exotic symmetry structures, which are sort of particular to asymptotically flat space, and uh, relates in one way or another to gauge transformations with non-compact support, to pheomorphisms with non-compact support, to BMS group, that, that sort of thing. Um, and increasingly, uh, people have started trying to understand what that has to say about the actual infrared divergence problem. So it might be that this is a useful formalism to really finally tackle this problem and get a nice, clean uh, formalism that's able to produce the correct infrared finite scattering states and infrared uh, finite observables. <clears throat> uh, so the basic idea that all of these papers take um, is basically to isolate the universal part of the infrared divergence and try to explain that with symmetry principles. So a sort of a hard soft factorization theorem uh, in perturbative on electrodynamics and gravity says if you take an S matrix element, so I haven't introduced this notation yet, but by this uh, uh, by this quantity, I just mean an S matrix element with N uh, scattering states, which I uh, use an infrared regulator to make finite. If you consider that S matrix element, you can write it as an S matrix element with a different infrared uh, regulator. So at a higher scale times some universal factor e to the minus gamma. And this amplitude over here is usually completely model dependent. It's not universal. You can't really say anything about it with symmetries. But this factor e to the minus gamma is universal. It depends very simply on sort of the quantum numbers of the external scattering states and these two scales that I've introduced. So you would hope to sort of compute it using symmetry principles. Um, and so what we're going to basically do is to devise a model uh, where a formula like this has a natural explanation, and this quantity here is basically being computed by a pseudo Goldstone degree of freedom that lives in two fewer dimensions. So that's going to be kind of the punchline uh, of the talk by the time I'm done. Are there any questions before we move on to the details? Okay. Yeah, maybe just maybe you can just say a little bit more explicitly exactly what the lambda would be defined as in, in your yeah so so mu is going to be just some hard cutoff which i use to regulate the path integral and define the quantities uh, make them finite big lambda is just going to be some scale that i choose to separate soft degrees of freedom and their contributions to the s matrix element from the hard contributions so i make a choice it needs to be small it should be sort of close to mu, we don't want to make it too big. But as long as I keep both of these scales relatively small, then I can calculate the contributions uh, from particles with support between mu and lambda, calculate that exactly, exponentiate it, and that's what produces this universal factor out here. Is that clear? Sure. Okay. You need a big hierarchy between hard scales and uh, mu and lambda for this actually to be a correct equation. Yeah, that's right. We, we, keep, we keep both mu and lambda relatively small 
yeah, otherwise you can't just use the soft photon and soft graviton theorems to calculate the contributions. <clears throat> okay, uh, so celestial CFT is in the topic in the title of the talk. Uh, and that's sort of the formalism that I'm going to use. So let me spend a couple of slides just introducing the idea. The basic uh, starting point in this story is just the fact that the Lorentz group acts uh, as the Euclidean conformal group, both on the space-like cuts of the null momentum cone and on the transverse cuts of scribe plus. So scribe plus is basically the space of null geodesics and flat space, which is basically the same thing as the null momentum cone is doing the same thing on the space light cuts of both, just access conformal rescalings uh, of the celestial sphere. So when I uh, write out the S matrix, I'm gonna use a convenient parameterization for all of the momenta in the problem, which makes that action uh, manifest. So I'm going to write a momenta basically as some overall scale, which I'll call omega times a reduced momentum which I can write in terms of two different null vectors, Q and N. So N is just going to be some fixed reference uh, null vector, and Q is going to only depend on the D coordinates on the transverse cuts of the null cone. So you can sort of, in, if we are in four bulk dimensions, you can think of these two coordinates as the coordinates on the sphere at scribe plus or scribe minus, okay? Now, uh, the Lorentz generators are simply related to the conformal uh, generators. They're just linear combinations. These J's are just the rotations, D is dilations, and then we have translations and special conformal transformations. And the Lorentz group is just acting on these coordinates X according to D-dimensional Euclidean conformal transformations. And sort of all of the interesting dynamics in this story is going to be uh, local in these X variables, which live in two fewer dimensions than the actual bulk quantum field theory or quantum uh, gravitational model. Okay, and because the Lorentz group uh, acts on these Xs like the conformal group, the S matrix is actually going to transform uh, like a correlation function in a D-dimensional conformal field theory. And that's sort of where this terminology, celestial and formal field theory comes from. You're sort of trying to rewrite the bulk S matrix in a way that uh, resembles a conformal field theory in uh, uh, the way that it happens in ADS CFT. Okay, so the sort of Lorentz invariant inner products in these variables are basically just separations in these X coordinates. Um, and later on, we will want to do loop integrals as well. Uh, and if you take that expression for uh, the general momenta that I had on the previous page, uh, you can just rewrite this measure as a d-dimensional integral, sort of a scale integral, an integral over this fictitious mass for the off-shell particle. So that, this is a formula that we will need when we try to uh, massage the one-loop infrared divergence into a, a form that we can interpret as a lower dimensional uh, quantity. Okay, so the next step is just to sort of do a trivial rewriting or change of notation uh, for the scattering amplitudes. I want to just take a scattering amplitude with n particles and I'll write it uh, as a correlation function where it looks like these uh, operators which create the scattering states uh, are local operators on the sphere at infinity. And then Lorentz invariance is going to fix the transformation properties of those operators. So this is a textbook formula, it just says that Lorentz generators acting on the creation annihilation operator just acts uh, with the orbital angular momentum and the spin piece. If you take this formula and you plug in my parameterization for the P's that we had on the previous slide, and you ask how do these operators transform, you'll find very familiar formulas. So the sort of translation part of the conformal group just act with derivatives, the rotations to the obvious Euclidean rotations. Nobody probably remembers the special conformal transformations, but it gets that right on the nose. Uh, 
uh, and the operators transform almost correctly under the dilation uh, operator and the conformal group. Uh, so this almost looks exactly like the transformation law for a d-dimensional conformal primary in Euclidean CFT. Uh, the one caveat is that the dilation operator is not diagonal in this basis. Uh, and that's just because momentum eigenstates, which are the things that we started with, are not boost eigenstates. And you'll remember that this dilation operator was really just a boost operator in the sort of D plus two dimensional language, okay? So these scattering operators, the plane wave states, they have sort of a formal scaling dimension, omega D omega. If you would like, to diagonalize the dilation operator and get things that really transform like uh, conformal primaries, then you have to do an integral over energy. So this is usually called the Mellon transform. You pick a scaling dimension and then you do an integral. Usually the contour is chosen to be non-compact. And then at least formally, the S matrix elements of these scattering states will transform precisely like uh, conformal uh, correlators or conformal primaries in D dimensions, so two dimensions fewer than, than the space time dimension. <clears throat> okay, and there's so those, those formulas were for massless particles. There's a similar transform that you can do for massive particles. You still have to do an integral over the scale omega. The only difference is now you actually have to convolve with a bulk to boundary propagator and do, do an extra integral. So you can sort of think about this formula as the space of massive momenta at fixed mass is just the Euclidean hyperbolic space on the interior of the null cone. And you're basically just using a bulk to boundary propagator for that hyperbolic space uh, to create something that transforms like a conformal primary. So that's why it's the Euclidean uh, ADS bulk to boundary propagator that shows up in this formula. <clears throat> and so in both cases, if you compute the S matrices uh, for these states, you'll find that they transform as d-dimensional conformal correlators. And that's the, sort of the starting point of the celestial CFT formalism, trying to sort of reformulate the bulk S matrix as something which lives on the conformal boundary at scribe plus and scribe minus um, and it sort of makes the conformal symmetry of the problem manifest. Now, in most of this talk, I'm actually not going to take uh, the Mellon transform, but we're still going to be investigating in what sense the, the S matrix behaves really like a lower dimensional, d-dimensional object. So I'm not going to be scattering these, uh, these Mellon transformed states. I'm just going to use plane wave states so that I have a clear definition of what it means to be hard or soft. Um, but I think you could transform the, the results pretty cleanly using the null transform. Uh, okay, are there any questions before we uh, move on to the specifics of the, the soft photon and the infrared divergence? I didn't understand, is the delta, it has a continuous spectrum or is it discrete somehow? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. There's still a little bit of confusion about that. Um, the original papers had some argument that it should really lie on these principal series uh, values, but there are special operators like the energy momentum tensor conserved currents, which I'll discuss in a moment, which actually don't lie on this series. And so I think there's still a little bit of a question whether or not you could get away with uh, a discrete spectrum and perhaps compact contours over here, or whether you really need all of these states. It's still sort of an open question in this uh, in this business. But in a couple of slides, I'll show you examples where you really need sort of integer dimension operators. Uh, any other questions? OK. Uh, so we're discussing soft exchange and soft emissions in, in gauge theory, and the sort of most Fundamental result uh, in that area is the soft photon theorem that just says that if you have a photon in the uh, external scattering state and you take its wavelength to be very large, you take its frequency to zero, 
you get this universal factorization theorem. So you get this one over omega pole, sometimes called a Weinberg pole, times these kinematic factors, which really depend only on the charges and momenta of the external particles. This basically just says that when you take the wavelength of the photon to be very large, it can't resolve short distance uh, interactions, so it just couples to the sort of long distance quantum numbers of the states. Uh, so what we'd like to do is to design an operator in celestial CFT, which sort of isolates this leading uh, Weinberg pole. We could do that either, oops, either by multiplying by omega and taking a limit omega to zero, or by doing a compact contour and just picking out the residue of this one over omega pole. So with either definition, this operator S has scaling dimension one, and you can calculate uh, its matrix elements exactly using the soft gear. So I inserted into some, um, some correlation function with a bunch of other operators, and I just get this factor of curly J. And it's important that curly J can actually be written just as a derivative of a logarithm. So this is just a rewriting of this uh, term up here. Now, in holographic examples, bulk gauge symmetries map onto global boundary symmetries. That's because the you know, quote unquote global part of the gauge group is physical and the physical symmetries and any duality have to match. Now, in d-dimensional conformal field theories, global symmetries usually come with a spin one dimension d minus one primary operator that satisfies a certain shortening condition or award identity. So it says that if you take the divergence of this operator inside a correlation function with a bunch of other charged operators, you just get a delta function uh, with the coefficients controlled by the transformation properties of those operators. So that's just the word identity for an abelian current in CFTD. Um, and while this is not quite the soft photon theorem, it is very closely related to it. So let me do sort of a quick manipulation to show you how they are related. I'm going to just take this formula here. I'll multiply by a derivative of a logarithm and then take an integral. Okay, now the right-hand side has a delta function. So I'll just use that to do the integral. That'll just give me the derivative of a logarithm multiplying uh, this reduced amplitude, but that of course was just the matrix element of the soft operator that I defined on the previous slide. Okay, So it looks like you sort of want to identify the soft operator as this non-local integral transform of this conserved current. Uh, and even better, we'd like to move this derivative off of the current onto the logarithm. So it's really just a transformation on the current. And it turns out that two derivatives on the logarithm is just the conformally covariant tensor, okay? Which is a familiar quantity in conformal field theory. Uh, so this non-local relationship between S and J is actually known in the conformal field theory literature. Uh, it's an example of the shadow transform. So it's something which basically doesn't touch the spin, but it maps an operator with dimension delta to one with dimension D minus delta. So we started with something with dimension one, it maps it to dimension d minus one and vice versa. Okay, and for a general representation, it takes a similar form. You just have a bunch of copies of the, uh, the tensor and a power of x minus y to d minus delta. Okay. That's an important property of the shadow transform that is actually its own inverse. So if you do it twice, uh, then you actually get the same operator back up to some a uh, numerical coefficient that depends on the dimension and the spin. So uh, using that fact that if you do it twice, uh, you get the same operator back, we can take this relation between the soft operator and the conserved current, just take a shadow transform again, uh, and we get a formula that says the conserved current is just the shadow transform of the soft operator that I defined. Okay, so the, the basic thing to take away from this is that just as in ADS-CFT, 
when you have a gauge field in the bulk in this celestial CFD formalism, you automatically get a conserved current in this quote unquote boundary theory. Okay. And if you take this definition for the conserved current, you can calculate its matrix elements and you can calculate the divergence of J. Uh, and what you will find is uh, if you take the divergence of J, you get a sum over charges, which you expected, times this sort of non-local term, which is the bulk to boundary propagator of a D-dimensional field in uh, Euclidean ADS, or the sort of the radial coordinate in ADS uh, corresponds to the mass of the massive particles. So if, for instance, these are all massless particles, then you're pushing the bulk to boundary uh, propagator to the boundary, and that localizes just to a delta function. So then you get exactly what you expect. The divergence of this abelian current just has contact term support with coefficients, which are the charges. The only sort of new uh, effect is that for massive states, it looks like a non-local charge distribution. The massive particle sort of casts a non-local shadow on the celestial sphere. And you can sort of expect that to happen just because you can't associate a single point on the celestial sphere to a massive particle because you could always just go to its rest frame, right? So it sort of had to be spread out on, on the sphere in some way or not. Okay. Are there any questions about this? The main takeaway is just, if you have an abelian gauge field in the bulk, then you get for free a conserved current in this d-dimensional uh, CFT. Okay, so that, that's all we really need about uh, soft emissions in abelian gauge theory. Those formulas were true in any number of dimensions. Now we wanna discuss soft exchange and see if we can also discuss that in d-dimensional length. Okay, so uh, we're going to be discussing infrared divergences for a couple of slides, and there's lots of different ways to regulate infrared divergences. The one that I'm going to use is to put in a hard IR cutoff, which I'll call mu. Uh, that regulates all of the infrared divergences, makes everything finite, and it means that I'm going to perform loop integrals only in the range omega larger than mu. I'm going to then choose a second scale, lambda, in order to sort of isolate the contributions of the soft particles from the contributions of the hard particles. So when I say soft contributions, it's going to mean uh, the parts of the integrals that come from this range, omega larger than mu, but small than lambda. And as we were discussing previously, if I keep both mu and lambda small, then I can calculate these contributions exactly and exponentiate them. Okay, so the general structure of the infrared divergence we already saw. So the left-hand side is an S matrix element uh, with an IR cutoff mu. I can write that as an S matrix element where I only perform loop integrals above the scale lambda. So this quantity here is completely IR finite. It doesn't depend on the IR regulator. We have no control over it. It's not determined by symmetries, but there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, times this universal factor e to the minus gamma. And this is where all of the soft contributions uh, to the scattering process enter. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I just said that. Okay, so you can calculate gamma basically just using the soft photon theorem. So you basically attach two photons to external legs, you get a factor p dot epsilon over p dot q, and then you integrate over that internal momentum. And notice that I'm only doing this integral between mu and uh, big lambda. So this is really only capturing the contributions of the soft quanta. We can always do this. We can always separate out this piece, calculate it and exponentiate it. It just won't be infrared divergent in more than four dimensions. Now, most treatments just go ahead and do this integral explicitly. Uh, but for me, it's actually going to be more useful to keep it in d-dimensional form. So I, I showed you earlier a formula for this d plus two-dimensional measure in terms of a d-dimensional integral, a scaled integral, and then an extra integral over kappa, which was sort of the, 
off skit off shell mass of the uh, internal state. So to do this integral, I just do the, in the integral over kappa using contour deformations. Then the scale integral just gets pulled out into an overall factor. That's where all of the infrared divergences enter the problem. And I'm left over with the d-dimensional integral, which is basically just an integral over the square of this leading soft photon factor, this derivative of the logarithm. Okay. So the point is that when d is greater than two, this quantity alpha is finite when you send mu to zero. So that's why there are no infrared divergences. When d is equal to two, then there's a logarithmic divergence in this integral, and that's what sets all of the amplitudes to zero when you remove the infrared cutoff. Now, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip uh, the gravitational case just for the sake of time, but it turns out that there's really an identical formula for the infrared divergence in, uh, in quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space. You again get basically the same scale integral. The only difference is that the d-dimensional integral is a square of the leading soft graviton factor rather than the soft photon factor. So because these two formulas are so similar in the rest of the talk, whenever I say large U1 gauge transformation, if you replace that with super translation, which is basically a large diffeomorphism in asymptotically flat space, then the exact same analysis carries through and you're able to reproduce uh, the infrared divergences and soft exchange in gravity in the same way that you do for abelian gauge there. And that's because really symmetry is fixing the form of the answer in both of these cases. <clears throat> okay, so what we like to do is to reproduce all of this structure using a d-dimensional model. Uh, and the approach that we want to take is to exploit the symmetry structure of gauge theory and gravity to sort of pin down the form that the action for that d-dimensional model can take. And what we want it to do is to reproduce the d plus two dimensional infrared physics. So we're not trying to make a d-dimensional model that captures everything about the higher dimensional gauge theory of gravity. Right now, we're just trying to stick uh, to the very long wavelength part of the model. So this is the basic uh, cartoon for, for why this procedure works. So we imagine that we're trying to calculate the S matrix element with some infrared cutoff mu, which I use to define this path integral on the right-hand side to regulate it and make it finite. We're just doing some Lorentzian uh, bulk path integral with some operator insertions that correspond to our external states. This phi just corresponds to all of the fields in the theory that I integrate over. <coughs> And again, to isolate the uh, just the infrared part of the physics, I'm going to make this arbitrary choice of another scale lambda, uh, and I'm going to say that the soft fields are the ones with support between mu and lambda, and the hard fields have support above lambda. And then I'm going to do something normal. I'm just going to integrate out all the short modes, all of the hard fields. Uh, hard soft factorization tells me that I will get a hard amplitude that does not depend on the infrared cutoff or any of the soft fields. And I'll be left over with an integral over the slow modes. Okay, so over these long wavelength uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and so a couple of things about this formula to note are that, you know, anticipation of the fact that we have sort of a Euclidean conformal field theory description in the celestial CFT formalism. I'm writing this as a Euclidean uh, action for the soft modes, and I expect it to be a d-dimensional action rather than a d plus two-dimensional action. Um, and I'm splitting it into two pieces. So the soft part of the action is going to describe the self-interactions of these long wavelength modes, while this interaction term is going to describe the coupling of these long wavelength modes to the hard external uh, particles in the scattering problem. Okay, so sort of, you know, what the long wavelength degrees of freedom see are basically just background sources um, sourced by these charged particles in the scattering state. Okay, so and yeah, 
as it were. Okay, so if we compare that formula to the general structure of the infrared divergence, what we need basically is a d-dimensional path integral which computes e to the minus gamma, okay, where the dependence on the external particles is encoded through this background source j. So this is sort of what we're after. We want to determine the form of the soft uh, action so that we can reproduce the infrared divergence. If in addition, we want to consider scattering amplitudes that also have soft insertions, so scattering amplitudes with soft photons in the initial or final state, then we need to be able to insert the soft photon operator in this path integral, do the integral, and get the products of soft factors that we know are there from the soft photon theorem, again, multiplying the infrared divergence, okay? So these are the sort of the two matching conditions that we're going to impose in order to fix uh, the soft pseudo Goldstone boson. Okay, and what we're going to do is basically fix the form of the soft actions just using symmetry considerations. And then the coupling constants, of course, will have to match onto the infrared divergence. So that's sort of our matching condition. <clears throat> okay. So the sort of the last piece of this discussion is just to really understand correctly what the symmetry breaking pattern is in gauge theory and gravity and asymptotically flat space when you put in an infrared regulator. So symmetries in quantum field theory, they can be approximate or exact. When they're exact, then they can be uh, spontaneously broken or unbroken, depending on the vacuum. Sometimes it's useful to consider an approximate symmetry as if it were exact, uh, because if the exact symmetry, if, if the system with the exact symmetry is in the broken phase uh, and the explicit breaking is small, then the pseudo Goldstone bosons can still be used to reliably approximate the low energy dynamics. Okay, that's sort of the use of pions. Um, now, in our case, it's a little bit exotic symmetry structure because we're interested in groups of gauge transformations or diffeomorphisms with non-compact support. Those are infinite dimensional groups. So I'm gonna call the huge infinite dimensional group uh, curly G. And this, you can think about it as U1 gauge transformations that don't vanish at spatial infinity that have some actual angular dependence uh, on the celestial sphere. And I'll, I'll refer to the constant uh, part of those transformations. So sort of the global U1 charge transformations just as regular G, okay? Now, the standard claim in all of this uh, literature about asymptotic symmetries and celestial CFT is that the vacuum is preserved by G, but not by curly G. So even when this curly G symmetry is exact, is spontaneously broken down to global G. So you would expect the extreme low energy dynamics to be described by some curly G mod G coset Goldstone bosons, okay? Uh, but the important point is that gauge theories suffer from infrared issues. Perturbative calculations are plagued by uh, infrared divergences and you have to regulate long wavelength fluctuations in one way or another to actually do the calculation. Now, any method that you choose to regulate that infrared divergence, whether it's a small photon mass, dim reg, finite volume regularization, something else, is going to explicitly break or change the curly G symmetry. So when we're writing down the action for these sort of edge mode gold stones, there can also be symmetry breaking terms in the action. And so what we really need to consider is pseudo goldstones associated to a symmetry with both spontaneous and explicit breaking. Now, I don't know if this will help anyone in the audience, but this is the same symmetry breaking pattern that occurs in JT gravity, which basically describes the pseudo goldstone associated to the IR divergence in ADS2. So there, there's a well-known uh, IR divergence for gravity in ADS2 throats, if you regulate it by uh, putting in a temperature for the black hole, then you explicitly break the diff S1 symmetry and then the Schwarzschild mode 
is just the diff S1 mod SL2 pseudo goldstone. So we basically have this story in ADS2, also an asymptotically flat space. The only difference is what these uh, groups look like. Okay, so in, in our example of U1 gauge theory, the relevant symmetry group is just the large gauge transformations with non-compact supports. So you can think of these really just as maps from the celestial sphere into U1, the unbroken subgroup is just the constant maps. That's just the global U1 uh, charge rotations that you uh, know and love. Uh, the relevant degree of freedom in this system, the sort of edge mode, Goldstone degree of freedom, is just a gauge field edge mode evaluated at scribe plus. It doesn't really matter how it appears. The only important fact is that both this degree of freedom and this symmetry are intrinsically d-dimensional. And that's really the reason why we're going to end up with a lower dimensional description of the infrared divergence and the soft emission. Uh, yeah, so this, this edge mode C is flat in most examples, and it realizes this curly G symmetry nonlinear. So it shifts inhomogeneously, just like a normal uh, Goldstone boson does. Now, when the curly G symmetry is exact but spontaneously broken, the effective action for C has to be invariant under all of those transformations. So that's a little bit puzzling. What sort of action could be invariant under an infinite dimensional symmetry group like curly G? Uh, if you think about it, you'll realize that the simplest example is just a model with d-dimensional abelian gauge invariance where we don't quotient by gauge transformations. Okay, so we started with the d plus two-dimensional abelian gauge theory. We identified this d-dimensional uh, edge mode and the sort of symmetries uh, which we don't quotient by for that degree of freedom are just d-dimensional uh, local U1 transformations. Uh, we also said that C was flat, so really the, the, the right model that has the correct uh, domain of integration and the right symmetries is something like a BF theory. Okay, so this is a d-dimensional abelian curvature. You integrate out B, that just says F is equal to zero, and you've isolated the correct uh, edge mode for the model. And that's the example where we don't break uh, the asymptotic symmetry. When we put in the infrared regulator, we explicitly break it. So the effective action can also contain symmetry breaking terms. Now, what are symmetry breaking terms in this language? They'll just be non-gauge invariant interactions for this d-dimensional gauge field that depend explicitly on C. Okay. Now, that's almost all we need to say. There's one important caveat, which is just that normally when you do effective field theory, you sort of have two inputs. You fix the symmetries, you identify the relevant degrees of freedom, and you impose locality. And then you just write all the terms which are consistent with those uh, three identifications. That's uh, effective field theory. Now here, we're certainly using symmetry to constrain the answer. And we've isolated the sort of relevant degree of freedom, which is this edge mode. But it's not obvious that we're supposed to impose locality because we're writing down this sort of interdimensional effective field theory, a lower dimensional model, which is supposed to capture long wavelength effects in a higher dimensional gauge theory. So it's not obvious how locality is gonna be manifested in this construction. And as we'll see in a minute, it's, it's actually a little bit subtle the way that it enters. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so having said that, this sort of most general agnostic symmetry breaking term that I can write down is just going to be quadratic in this gauge field edge mode with some propagator which may or may not be ultra local. So if I chose it to be just a delta function, then this would just be a mass term for C. And then when I integrate out the B field, that would enforce a flatness condition. And the mass term for C would just turn into a kinetic term for the gauge parameter theta, okay? <clears throat> so the important point to note about this action is just that it explicitly breaks the curly G symmetry. So you can have gauge fields which are pure, pure uh, large U1 gauge transformation that still pick up an action from this term. 
but it is still invariant under the global U1 transformations. Okay. So th this is going to be our ansatz for the form of the soft action. We also need to pin down the form for the interaction term, and then we just match onto the infrared divergence and we're done. To determine the interaction term, all we really need to know is how these, these vertex operators that create the scattering states transform under the large U1 uh, transformations. And you can work this out uh, in many different ways, just using space-time analysis, the results are several years old. Um, if it's a massless scattering state, then remember this bulk to boundary propagator is just a delta function. So that just says that this operator transforms like e to the iq epsilon. That's sort of an expected formula. The only difference is that when it's a massive state, you have to do this, this extra integral with the bulk to boundary. Okay, so that suggests that in the action, we should have a term like theta with a background source, which is this bulk to boundary propagator for every term uh, for each particle in the scattering state. If you add uh, one of those for each particles, you'll get an interaction term that looks like theta times uh, sum of charges weighted by these bulk to boundary terms, these non-local mass distri charge distributions uh, do the massive particles. Now, you'll recall that this Q times the bulk to boundary propagator is actually just the divergence of this U1 current J. So a better way to write this term, if I just integrate by parts, is as a coupling between this d-dimensional gauge field and this d-dimensional background current J. And that's sort of exactly what we expect, right? We expected that this Goldstone mode should have uh, a coupling to the external particles just in terms of background sources. And that's exactly what this formula says. <clears throat> okay, so now we've fixed the form of the action. All we have to do is evaluate the soft path integral and match it onto the infrared divergence. Okay, so this was the formula that we require. We do the soft path integral. Uh, and we expect to get e to the minus gamma, where gamma was just this integral uh, of the soft photon factors. Now, uh, the soft action that I just described was Gaussian, so we can just do it explicitly. And what you will get is just double integral with this non-local propagator uh, times the two background currents, J. So if you did the free boson with the local propagator in two dimensions, this would just be the, you know, e to the i, e to the minus k squared term. Uh, and so we want to match this expression onto e to the minus gamma. And that naively looks like it could be difficult, uh, but if you remember this small j was just the shadow transform of curly j, right? This curly J was sort of associated to the soft photon operator and the small J was associated to the shadow transform, which was the abelian current. And uh, so if you choose the propagator uh, so that you can use these two integrals to basically perform shadow transforms, that will turn small J into curly J. And then you just do an extra integral to match this integral, okay? So this is the correct choice for the propagator that matches the soft path integral onto the infrared divergence. And as I said, it looks non-local. It looks a little bit weird. Um, but you can invert that propagator using the formal properties of the shadow transform. And if you plug it into the soft action, you'll find that although it does look very non-local in terms of the original Goldstone edge mode, it actually looks completely local in terms of the shadow transformed edge mode, okay? So I'm basically just doing these integrals to turn these Cs into C tildes, and what you get is a nice local answer, but in a different variable, okay? And you can also take this uh, interaction term that we have between the edge mode and the background current use the fact that small j was the shadow transform of curly j to move the shadow transform onto C. And you can also write this interaction term 
in terms of the shadow transform of the edge mod. Okay. Uh, so, the BF uh, Daniel, presumably the BF term is also invariant under this uh, change of variables you're doing here? Or? Uh, yeah, well, I'm always just going to do the BF integral uh, ah. identically. So then, so it, this C is just going to be flat, right? That's just kind of a book keep, bookkeeping uh, term in the, the path. Okay, so we're almost done and I'm almost out of time. So a couple of key points. So although the action appeared non-local in terms of the bulk edge mode, the shadow edge mode does behave just like a local degree of freedom. So if you take this action just written in terms of the shadow edge mode uh, and you just do the path integral, you will reproduce exactly the infrared divergence in the D plus two dimensional Gaia case there. Uh, so this might suggest that sort of appropriate set of local operators and Celestial CFT for asymptotically flat space are really shadow transforms of bulk operators. I think that's still an open question, but it does seem to show up pretty frequently. All right, the last two minutes, uh, we just want to show how to also describe soft emissions using the d-dimensional model. So remember that I also wanted to be able to insert soft photons in the external states, do the soft path integral, and get a product of these soft factors, again, multiplied by the infrared divergence. So that's one constraint that we'll impose. And we also want that when we integrate out that external degree of freedom, we get back the soft action that I just described. Okay, so this is a degree of freedom, uh, which is really only relevant when there are uh, external soft photons in the state, when there aren't any, you can just integrate it out, then you better get back the soft action that we just derived, okay? And you can do this, again, just using the symmetries of the problem, uh, because the shadow transform of this soft operator is the abelian current in the model. Noether's theorem basically tells you that there has to be this coupling between this gauge field edge mode uh, and this current J, J was the shadow transform of S. So I can move that onto the gauge field. So I know that there had better be a coupling between the gauge field edge mode uh, and this soft photon degree of freedom. And then you can just fix the rest of the action by requiring that when you integrate this degree of freedom out, you get back to the previous action that I had. You'll find that the, the kinetic term is just Gaussian for this new degree of freedom. So the full soft action that computes everything in the infrared sector of a billion gauge theory looks like this. There's sort of one scalar field uh, whose derivative is just the soft photon operator. And then there's this sort of shadow uh, gauge field edge mode. S has a normal uh, kinetic term and uh, gauge field edge mode couples to S and to these background sources, J. And it's pretty trivial to see that this action calculates everything exactly. If you insert a bunch of the soft operators into the path integral, that's a bunch of derivatives of phi. I'll do the integral over this edge mode C that just acts as a Lagrange multiplier and that sets S equal to curly J. So all of these insertions of S in the correlation just become soft photon factors. And then this kinetic term for S just becomes the infrared divergence, okay? So sort of in two lines, you can see that this action computes everything about the infrared sector of abelian gauge theory. Now, as I said, I, I didn't give you all of the formulas for the gravitational case, but an identical action completely determined by symmetries also computes everything about the infrared and uh, gravity in asymptotically flat space. So you can think of this uh, C as the shadow transform basically of a metric edge mode. It's sort of the leading symmetric traceless uh, perturbation of the metric at scry. Take it shadow transform it uh, couples basically to this soft graviton operator and a bunch of background sources. If you insert the soft graviton uh, operators into the path integral, you do the integral over C that sets 
all of them equal to the soft graviton uh, soft factors, and then the kinetic term for n just becomes the gravitational infrared divergence. So this is sort of, I didn't give you all the symmetry explanations, but it's basically the same story as the Bayesian gauge theory. And I think it's interesting because it's essentially proof that the BMS group plays a role in quantum gravity in any number of dimensions. The pseudo, the super translation pseudo Goldstones, they really calculate soft exchange in any number of dimensions. Uh, okay, so I'll finish there. Uh, there are a couple of other interesting points in the analysis. If you're interested, you can look at the paper. We consider to be engaged theories with magnetic charge. There, the winding symmetry in the compact boson maps onto the magnetic charge in the gauge theory. One thing we didn't treat was the IR divergent phase in the S matrix. It actually has qualitatively different properties than the, uh, in the, than the real part of gamma. And it's not clear to us whether or not there's a nice, clean, d-dimensional explanation of that term. We're still thinking about it. Um, and of course, really, the, the reason we tackle this problem at all is because it's sort of a warm-up to the non-abelian case, which is going to be much more complicated. So you can sort of still use symmetry considerations to constrain the pseudo-Goldstone action, but both the Goldstone path integral and the bulk path integral can only be computed in perturbation theory. So sort of the hope would be that you relate the four-dimensional non-abelian gauge theory to some two-dimensional non-abelian Goldstone bosons. And you know, even though that model it still has to be treated non-perturbatively, we have much better control over it than we do full-blown four-dimensional gauge theory. So you'd like to try to lift some of the facts that you know about the two-dimensional non-abelian goldstone up to the four-dimensional gauge theory. So that's, that's sort of where we're headed. And I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there. Any questions? Thanks, Daniel, for a very nice talk. Do we have uh, any questions for him? Does this apply to three dimensions? And uh, if so, how does symmetry breaking work in a 1D model? Yeah, I mean, three dimensions is a little bit tricky because even there, well, I mean, even the abelian gauge theory is confined in three dimensions, they do it kinematically because the Coulomb potential is already logarithmic in three dimensions. Uh, and then, you know, some of the models also develop actual linear confining potentials in 3D. Um, yeah, so it's true I had, uh, I had really in mind four dimensions and higher here. My suspicion is that, uh, well, I think the three-dimensional case, if you actually want to do it correctly, will be similar to the four-dimensional non-abelian case, because really the, the thing which you're trying to reproduce is a confining gauge theory. And everything that I've used here was sort of based on perturbation theory and exponentiation of a perturbative calculation. Um, so I don't think I have a great answer to your question. I think it's an interesting question. Um, but I think presumably you could still use uh, use the symmetry principles to sort of write down the, the Goldstone action. Um, but there might be non perturbative effects that you also sort of need to keep track of, which are more important. Daniel, if I if I were to summarize in like a, a sentence, uh, what you told us today would be that um, the soft uh, sector contribution to S matrix elements uh, amounts to uh, a particular uh, Gaussian Euclidean uh, path integral over uh, over uh, over some degrees of freedom that are local. On, it's a local integral over the celestial sphere. Uh, and where the only thing that uh, the only input I guess from uh, the hard sector is a shift of the mean of this Gaussian kind of uh, uh, wave function associated to. So I, I should think there's a there's a way of thinking about this Euclidean pattern you're you're, you're uh, telling us about as sort of assigning a state 
to these soft modes and the mean of that state is sort of shifted depending on what kind of the conserved charges of the hard modes are. Is this, uh, is this a reasonable sort of uh, slightly different way of looking at what you told us today? Uh, yeah, I guess the way that I think about it is really that it's sort of a, a d-dimensional Gaussian model with background sources. So I, I would, and you know, if you want to think about background sources as creating a state, then probably you can massage it into a statement that uh, that you made. But you know, the, the formulas that we get, they really look like a lower dimensional flat gauge field coupled to background currents, and the background currents are just the electromagnetic currents produced by the hard particles in the scattering states. Um, same, same statement is true for the uh, gravitational mm -hmm. model, sort of a higher spin source. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the issues with this sort of proposed, you know, holographic correspondence is that, you know, the, the time variable doesn't match in the two descriptions. There really isn't a time variable in the boundary description the way that there is an ADS CFT, and that obscures a lot of uh, sort of clean statements that you'd like to be able to, to make. It's not really clear how states map onto states and unitarity is reflected in this putative boundary description. I think that's one of the, the biggest questions holding the subject back. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's definitely worth thinking about. Does Lorentz invariance have a simple realization in the in the infrared sector here? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, let's see. Yeah, I mean, in the sense that the the Gaussian models that I wrote down all have conformal invariance and conformal invariance in D dimensions is the Lorentz invariance in, uh, in, the, in the bulk model. Yes. Symmetry breaking doesn't mess up the Lorentz invariance. There, there is, yeah, I mean, there's this, a strain of literature in, in the infrared divergence problem, which discusses this issue that uh, sort of long range fields do uh, and the boundary conditions that you have to impose on them do uh, interact very subtly with Lorentz invariance. Um, you know, there's papers about spontaneous breaking of Lorentz invariance and models with infrared divergences and that sort of thing. I'm not sure if that's what you have in mind. I don't see any direct reflection of it in this computation, but it, it might be there somewhere and I just am not recognizing it. Um, you know, so I mean, from my point of view, the Fidei of Coolidge states are, are not really Lorentz covariant in that the Lorentz transformation isn't a unitary transformation there. Okay, yeah, then we are talking about the same thing. Um, yeah, I mean, here, you know, one of the reasons that I'm trying to set all this formalism up very carefully is because I like to understand better the Padea Kulish construction in, in this language. And I think what it basically amounts to is inserting coherent states of this second degree of freedom, this D phi into the S matrix. So you would calculate uh, correlation functions of like E to the I phi, and that basically amounts to inserting coherent states of photons into the scattering states. Um, but everything here is really done sort of in standard perturbative quantum field theory language with an infrared cutoff, which I agree is not uh, necessarily the morally best way to approach the problem. Um, my hope is that having established all of these formulas, we can then use them to kind of better understand the Padea of Coolish uh, construction. But yeah, I am aware that there are complications uh, with, with Lorentz invariance and address states. I don't really have anything useful to say about it, unfortunately. I have just a, a general kind of question. 
in ordinary holography, it's sort of important to have gravity being dynamical in, in ADS in order for there to be a real kind of physical local quantum field theory dual. Um, even though you could say something, this, some things about symmetries and, and it, some aspects of, of holography, I guess, are, are there even if you considered some quantum field theory in ADS. So I wonder if in your case now, is, is there something to suggest that the gravitational version has more chance of giving you some actual uh, legitimate yeah, physical dual? I think there's a very similar statement. So in this paper that I wrote with Prahar, I guess now four or five years ago, we showed, so I showed you basically how to construct an abelian current from the leading soft photon theorem. Soft gravitons, they have basically two universal terms in the soft expansion. There's a leading one, which basically gives you currents corresponding to translation invariance. There's also a subleading term. And if you try to make an operator out of that subleading term and take its shadow transform, you find that it's an operator that satisfies all of the word identities of an energy momentum tensor and a d-dimensional conformal field theory. So in ADS, you know, the usual statement there, you know, gravity breathes life into the, the CFT because it gives it the local energy momentum tensor. And that's sort of the, the basic thing that we request of, of local quantum field theories. Right. And the same thing basically happens here. I, I didn't describe it, but it, it's it's almost isomorphic. And um, so I, I would say, yeah, I think it, it looks very similar that you sort of, you need gravity in order to get the, the energy momentum tensor in CFT. Can these subleading uh, uh, soft theorems be somehow incorporated in that story you were uh, uh, telling? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think so. I mean, I think what it would basically amount to is trying to exponentiate not just the very leading infrared divergent piece of contributions to the S matrix, but also sort of the next piece, which is also universal. Mm -hmm. So sort of the way that you build the IR divergent piece is you, you attach two soft photons and then you integrate over the, uh, the space of momenta for that degree of freedoms. If you instead attach both sort of the leading and subleading piece for the graviton, you would get a different answer. The correction would be subleading in the energy expansion. And my guess would be that there is some d-dimensional model that incorporates both the super translation and variance and this sort of uh, degree of freedom associated to conformal invariance in a way that confuses it. The problem is just that you know, it's an energy momentum tensor. So this is probing the non-abelian character of gravity. The sort of leading uh, piece of gravity is abelian because in gravity, the charge is the energy. So if you have no energy, then you have no charge. And so it behaves more like abelian gauge theory than non-abelian gauge theory. But the energy momentum tensor is associated basically to the Lorentz transformation. So those are intrinsically non-abelian. So now that problem becomes almost as difficult as the non-abelian gauge theory. It's very, you might be able to do that path integral exactly because of some special symmetry considerations, but I, I, haven't, I haven't thought about it yet. But it's a great yeah. question. Mm -hmm. would, would that involve a, a super rotation uh, symmetry breaking? Yeah, I think that's the suggestion. Um, some people who have discussed this with me think that it would be one of these sort of uh, it would be something like a Schwarzschild action for, for this degree of freedom. You basically want an action which is invariant under the conformal group, uh, but that gives action to sort of uh, other reparameterization. So what, what you have to understand is how that piece of the action couples to this leading piece, which is associated to super translations. It's the whole, you know, they, they talk to each other. Uh, so I, I think something like that should be true. I just don't, I don't know how to show it yet. Is there, is, is there a non-trivial orbit of the vacuum with respect to super rotation? Can you create other vacuum with super rotation? <clears throat> yeah, people have looked at that. Um, what happens is that they don't look really like asymptotic. Well, they look almost like at their, they're like locally asymptotically flat space time. So if you try to do 
a finite super rotation, you'll basically end up putting like a deficit or a singularity somewhere in the geometry, basically at some point on the sphere where the, where the, the, uh, the vector field becomes singular. Um, so it's not really clear to me how to think about those in the, the phase space or the, the Hilbert space of asymptotically flat gravity. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question to work on. If you had a complete understanding of the soft sector of the theory, would there be a way to construct a consistent theory that just described the hard sector? And then you could forget about the whole today of foolish shoes, or is there some reason that 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 will always be inconsistent? Well, that that's really what people want, right? Like the the dream of this whole celestial CFT program is that we sort of figure out an independent d-dimensional description, which just calculates everything in gauge theory coupled to gravity, da da da, the way that that we have sort of an independent definition of quantum gravity in the anti-decider space via conformal field theory, which has an independent definition and different set of rules for computation. Um, but most of the work I would say has sort of gone in the other direction. People take the sort of D plus two dimensional bulk answers and try and do these Mellon transforms, see what they get. Um, but there's not so far any real unifying principle or independent calculational scheme that would allow you to compute the S matrix elements. Now, something like Lamprost was suggesting where we kind of try to build in hard stuff by including subleading contributions to the soft expansion could work. Um, you know, so like you know, these actions that I've given you are sort of the first quantities that really look like quantum field theory that that we've found that calculate the higher dimensional stuff in asymptotically flat space. So it might be that you take these models and you start trying to improve them with contributions from, from the soft expansion and you can build sort of away from the zero momentum uh, sector. But I, I don't know that it's guaranteed to work or, uh, or if that's necessarily the best way to do it. Well, presumably there is a, 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 an action that incorporates the subleading uh, soft, uh, soft uh, graviton uh, contributions would be analogous to like some uh, a, a the an effective theory for the energy dynamics of the putative independently defined celestial theory, sort of like a, one of these hydrodynamic theories that people construct in ADS uh, or, you know, the sport jump being an example of that. But uh, I mean, Okay, that wouldn't pin down the macroscopics, but uh, it would it could use it could give useful insight into what types of microscopic theories could have a sector uh, described by that by, by that energetics. So yeah, I think that's definitely a, a noble goal to pursue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I think the one thing that I would say is just like as you say. Everything that I did here is determined by symmetries, and everything that you're suggesting will also basically be determined by symmetry. So it really only has a chance to sort of describe these hydrodynamic type models, yeah. which are sort of pinned down by by their symmetry and transport properties. But, but yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting problem. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank uh, Danny one more time. Thanks, Dysok. Um,